Bible is the divinely inspired, infallible word of the living God inerrant in the original autographs. The Bible does not contain the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. And within the Bible is everything we need to know for what we are to believe and how we are to behave. The Bible is the final authority for every Christian in all matters of faith and practice. So please take your Bible and open it to the third chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Last Sunday we were investing time in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 21 and 22. This time we're going to be considering the first three verses of this next very important chapter of God's holy word. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 through 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the administration of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before briefly. Now this is one of those sets of scripture verses which if you approach without careful consideration of the context can prove not to be difficult to understand but actually completely baffling to many people. And part of the reason for this is the fact that the Apostle Paul is, is a truly brilliant man with a marvelous education, with a, a very sharp intellect, and he's capable of contemplating many different things at the same time or in exceedingly quick succession. That kind of thing happens with people who are blessed with a high IQ. In fact, I know someone who was told one day that uh, sometimes when he's involved or engaged in a conversation, he will answer people's questions before they've actually asked them. Uh, and occasionally in jest, it's been suggested that maybe he's psychic. It's not that he's psychic at all, but what he's doing ahead of time is uh, thinking through every possible uh, way that can be addressed evaluating them all, coming to a conclusion, and then giving the answer before really the question has been properly asked. It can be confusing uh, for a lot of people. And, and that's a little bit of uh, the background, I think, to what is happening here. The Apostle Paul is just absolutely full of God's truth at this point, and he's, he's, he's wanting to get it out. And so he says, for this reason, and then did you notice he doesn't give the reason? He may not have spotted it immediately. He actually doesn't give the reason until he gets all the way down to what we call now verse 13. Therefore I ask you not to become discouraged about my tribulation in your behalf since they are your glory. You see, for this reason refers back to what has never been possible until this particular time. The building together of the saints, seeing that the Jews and the Gentiles are being built together. Because the Ephesian Gentile believers are fellow citizens with God's people, the Jews, they're included in the temple of God, a dwelling of God. Now if you've been following along in this series exploring Ephesians, you will know that we have invested considerable time addressing the amazing truth of what Paul is speaking about at this time, or writing in this epistle. The joining together for the very first time of both Jews and Gentiles in one body, the church. And since that's the case, you may be wondering why the Apostle Paul is concerned to take up so much time to explain the quotes before and after situation of the uh, Ephesian Gentile believers. 
and especially why he's so concerned that they fully understand that their complete equality with the Jews in the body of Christ is so important. And I believe one of the reasons is that he doesn't want the Ephesian believers, mainly Gentiles, to take their salvation and their unity with the Jews in the body of Christ, the church, for granted. This is because when that happens, important details and truths can be forgotten and salvation itself can actually be taken for granted. For example, we are here today in a country filled with churches and many people who say and claim that they are Christians. People who believe in God and yet many of them have absolutely no idea at all that Jesus was actually a Jew. They'll talk about the Ten Commandments with great concern and say it really bothers them that the Ten Commandments are being removed from public view in public places. But if you were to ask them uh, to recite the Ten Commandments, many of them would be completely unable to do so. Is that important? Absolutely, it is important. Knowing that unity with the Jews in the body of Christ, the church, is a radical new situation, brings with it a deeper and, I believe, a proper appreciation and sense of gratitude for our salvation. In fact, I don't believe it would be exaggerating to say it's life-changing. Knowing this truth and understanding it has the potential to significantly impact our conduct so that we are motivated to walk worthy of our high calling in Christ Jesus and not according to the ways of the flesh. Now you may recall if you were with us in the earlier ser uh, uh, sessions of this series uh, that the epistle to the Ephesians is really divided into two main sections. You have verses 1, uh, chapters 1 through 3, which really deal with doctrine. Doctrine is what we know and what we believe. The last three chapters of the epistle deal with what we call duty, how we are to behave and conduct ourselves. Unfortunately, that word doctrine is sometimes re, uh, viewed by Christians as not really important. They don't see how it has an impact and directly relates to our daily lives. Not too long ago, a person spoke to me about doctrine saying, well, you know, John, I don't really think we need to get into that so very, very much. We just need to believe in Jesus. That's what's really important. Well, it most certainly is important, yes, to believe in Jesus. And that's precisely why it's really extremely important that we consider doctrine carefully. The reason is very simple. What you do believe has a direct bearing on your behavior. Not sure? Well, if you believe you'll get away with it, what's going to happen? Most likely, you're going to do it. Other people look at the first three chapters of Ephesians and they view them only as theoretical. They say they're much more interested in being practical. And so they tend to skip over these first three uh, chapters of the epistle and go to the last three, except, of course, for their favorite verses, which typically would be in chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And I'm sure most of you know Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and could quote it if I called on you, but relax, I'm not going to do that. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Just that simple statement makes it clear that nothing you do can earn or merit salvation or contribute to your salvation. It is by grace through faith. It is the gift of God, not the result of works that you have accomplished so that no one may boast. 
We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. By now, you know already that we're not going to skip over any part of Holy Scripture. We believe in the verbal and plenary inspiration of Holy Scripture. Therefore, nothing is unnecessary, nothing is redundant or without particular value. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture, not some, is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. I drove by a church which had a large signboard outside and it said, take the Bible seriously, but not literally. And those people have a major problem. The problem is that the quality and character of our Christian life today, as it's described in the last three chapters of this epistle, is dependent on closely coupled to a proper understanding of the doctrinal truths which are contained in the first three chapters. For this reason, Paul writes, and he's referring back to the building together of the saints, the Jews and the Gentiles, into the body of Christ. Because you Gentiles are fellow citizens with God's people, and especially you Ephesian Gentiles are included in the temple of God, a dwelling of God. It was the time of Paul's conversion to Christ. He was commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the gospel among the Gentiles. We read about it in Acts chapter 26, verse 12. He tells the story of what happened to him. As I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, I was on the way, and I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining round about me, and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you persecuted. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you as a servant and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen me, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who've been sanctified by faith in me. The Jews of Paul's day were absolutely infuriated when Paul taught that believing Gentiles were full members of God's family and the fellowship of saints. Even in the church of that day, many Jewish believers thought that the Gentiles needed to become Jews in order to be really full Christians. Or at least they should be regarded as sort of a second-class kind of citizen in the kingdom. They absolutely hated Paul's wholehearted acceptance of the Gentiles into the church, free from all the Jewish laws, traditions, and customs and they resented his zealous, far-reaching efforts to bring more and more Gentiles into the church. The vast majority at that time of the unbelieving Jews regarded Paul with horror. They viewed him as a dangerous heretic. But Paul didn't criticize them for that. He didn't say anything about their opposing him. He knew from where they had coming, were coming because he'd actually lived that himself. The next phrase in verse 1, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Remember, Paul was in prison when he was writing this epistle. So his mentioning his bonds was natural. He was un actually under house arrest at the time, and yet he describes himself not as a prisoner of Rome, 
but of Christ Jesus. Paul understood, you see, that his imprisonment was part of God's will for him. He probably mentioned it as a, as a sort of a circumstance that must have prepared his readers to enter into the, the spirit of his prayers on their behalf. The impressive theme which he had been writing about suggested a reference to his special function as the apostle to the Gentiles. The next phrase picks that up. For the sake of you Gentiles. Paul shares some reasons for his imprisonment. He's a prisoner, first of all, on behalf of the Gentiles. And that refers to the fact that not only was his, had his arrest come about because he was preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, but to the fact that it benefited the Gentiles. And that's why the Apostle Paul was charged with sedition against the emperor by the Jews. They were so angry that Paul would think he could carry any message from God to the Gentiles. Jewish scruples and prejudices were strong. They were terribly offended that the Gentiles could possibly have equal standing with them before God. And when Paul spoke to the Jewish mob in defense of his position after he was arrested in the temple courts, to their credit, the Jewish crowd listened to him very patiently until he reached the moment when he described how God had commissioned him to go for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And that was the absolute trigger which renewed their hatred and anger and stirred them up so that they raised their voices and they said, away with such a fellow. He should not be allowed to live. They wanted his death. They were shouting out, throwing off their cloaks. They were tossing dust up into the air as they mobbed him. They would have lynched him on the spot, but for the intervention of the Roman guard. It was because of this great message that Paul was a prisoner. And maybe you're thinking, well, you know, it's a couple of thousand years ago, John. Yes, that's true. But had that man not been willing to do what he did when God commissioned him, you and I probably would not be here today. That's the relevance and the reality of that situation. And so verse 1 and verse 13 are kind of like brackets or parentheses around all the intervening verses between them. And the Apostle Paul, as if describing a circle, comes round at length to the point from which he originally started. Verses 2 and 13. Two thirteen, a one long parenthesis. The connection is, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is going to pray that what has been revealed to him will be revealed to them clearly as well. Listen carefully. Paul is a prisoner because he's preaching the truth. And make no mistake about it, Prison was no picnic, even house arrest. One of the hymn writers put it this way, Afflictions may test me, they cannot destroy. One glimpse of thy love turns them all into joy. The trials that imprison you need not limit God's work within you. The story is told of a, a Scottish minister. His name was Alexander White. He was a man who was blessed by God with a disposition that enabled him to look at the bleakest situation possible and yet find something in it for which to be very thankful. And it was one winter Sunday morning. It was very dark. The weather was freezing cold. It was wet and stormy. And one of the deacons, just before the service, quietly whispered, I'm sure the preacher won't be able to find 
something for which to thank God on a day like this. When the service began, the pastor began the service by praying, We thank thee, O God, that the weather is not always like this. There's a teaching today in some churches and on a number of television programs that God promises health and wealth to all of his children. The teaching is completely false. Actually, it's heresy. And the truth is that though while most of us are not captivated by that particular error, we sometimes tend to think, even if we wouldn't admit it, that, you know what, if I walk obediently with the Lord, he will reward me with protection from trials. And some people even teach that it's okay to get angry with God when trials come upon us. The underlying assumption is, I really don't deserve this kind of treatment. No matter how difficult our trials, God never treats us unjustly and never sends trials into our lives without having a purpose on his part. The fact is, to even think I don't deserve this kind of treatment is the absolute opposite of what is true. We do deserve eternal punishment, damnation for the sins in our lives. We are only saved by the mercy and grace of God. So unjustly suffering, Paul is experiencing. He hadn't done anything wrong. He was suffering because he'd gone to a lot of personal bother, actually, to do something good. What did he do good, John? Thank you for asking. He actually worked to raise money, a gift from the Gentile churches, and he'd personally taken it to Jerusalem to help alleviate the suffering of the Jewish Christian people. There was a recognition of their responsibility to brothers and sisters who were in need. Behind his actions, no doubt, was his strong desire to see the Jewish and Gentile wings of the church coming together and uniting in love. And so he took this gift to Jerusalem, but what happened when he got there? Some of the Jews saw him in the temple, and so they decided they're going to start a riot. So they falsely accused him of bringing some Gentiles beyond the barrier into the temple. There was a riot, and that led to Paul's imprisonment. And that imprisonment had been going on for about five years. And during that time, the Apostle Paul could have very easily become very bitter toward the Jewish Christians and among those Jews who had falsely accused him. But he wasn't suffering because he denied the truth, but because he boldly proclaimed the truth. Every preacher knows you can avoid a lot of hassles if you tiptoe around the difficult doctrines and just preach nice, happy messages that make everyone feel good on their way out of church. But God had revealed certain truths to Paul. And Paul's living to please God, who examines the heart. He wasn't living just to please people. You know, it would have been very much easier for the Apostle Paul, in fact, to say, uh, let's, let's just make peace with this uh, situation. Let's compromise a little. Well, we, we recognize we, we don't agree on everything, but unity is much more important than the truth. I've actually heard that said on a number of occasions. It's not true. Unity is not more important than the truth. The truth is supreme. It is the truth that sets you free. It's an error today in some areas of the country, called open theism. It teaches that God is not all-knowing, completely all-knowing. He's not omniscient. He's not really truly sovereign over the tragic things that happen. He's just as upset as you and I are, but he can't do anything about it. The people who believe that are trying to get God off the hook for some of the bad 
things that are happening in the world, the evil and the suffering. That's completely wrong. In the Bible, God, God makes it perfectly clear that he's fully and completely sovereign over everything, including our trials. And then the next phrase in this verse is interesting. The administration of God's grace which was given to me for you. Paul is suffering for no wrong he had done, but there's no hint here of self-pity. There's no complaint on his part because his focus, and that's the key thing, his focus was on Christ Jesus as his sovereign Lord. And he also wanted to help the Ephesians understand God's purposes in his imprisonment. There's more. Paul never ceased to be thankful for God's grace. The grace that had been shown to him in the gospel. He was formerly, you remember, a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent aggressor. Yet he was shown mercy and God's grace was more than abundant for the one who described himself as the chief of sinners. If you think about where you used to be before you were saved, and where you would be today if God had not broken into your life with his grace, it must surely cause you to overflow with gratitude. Listen carefully. It's really important that you hear and understand this. Nobody, no exceptions, nobody has ever come to saving faith in Christ by his own intelligence his own will, his own good works. If you are a Christian, it's not because you thought of all the options and due to your superior intelligence and high moral standards, you decided to follow the Lord. The Bible indicts us all without exception. And if you doubt that, Listen to Romans 3, 10 through 18. It's highly relevant to where the Apostle Paul was and where we are today. Both Jews and Greeks, all-encompassing, are all under sin. As it is written, there is no righteous person, not even one. You're going to hear the words, no one, several times. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks out God. What does that say to the so-called seeker-sensitive groups? They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one who does go good. There is not even one. Do you think we're getting the message? Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. They have not known the way of peace. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And we see it and experience it daily. And the highest authorities in our land will quite cheerfully take the name of our God in vain and blaspheme. And God says he will not allow that, and he will address it and deal with it. Don't be so free in your use of the expression OMG. It's serious. It's part of the Ten Commandments. What do you think of as you hear these verses of Scripture? The ones I've just read. Well, is it like this? Well, that may describe other people, but really, it, it doesn't really describe me. And if you think that way, you don't understand, and you've never experienced God's grace in the gospel. This means that whatever you may choose to think or believe about yourself and your unrighteousness, you're still, listen, facing an eternity with all the other unsaved people in a place of eternal darkness and suffering. You see, Jesus didn't come to call the righteous. He said, I came to call sinners to repentance. 
And you have to know, believe, and understand that you are completely lost and utterly helpless to contribute anything toward your salvation before you'll get to the place where you'll cry out to Jesus, Save me, Lord, or I perish. The hymn writer Augustus Top Lady expressed it in a very well-known hymn. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. So nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. In naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Saviour, or I die. The truth is, the real truth is, salvation is totally a precious, undeserved gift of God's rich grace. Last week, I mentioned St. Paul's Cathedral in London, England. The context was in contrast with McCaig's Folly, a building which was never completed, and the cathedral which was completed within the lifetime of Sir Christopher Wren, the man who designed it, the architect, as will the glorious church of our Lord Jesus Christ be completed. And you say, when? We don't know when. Yes, we do. The Bible tells us. Well, that's interesting, John. I'd never thought that before. When will it be completed? When the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. We'll not go into that right now, but perhaps some other Sunday morning. Sir Christopher Wren, the architect of St. Paul's Cathedral, was uh, making a, a, a visit to the building construction site one day to see how the work was going. He came across a man and he asked him, uh, so uh, what are you doing? The man was cutting and chipping away at some stones and he said, well, I'm cutting this uh, stone to a, a certain size and shape that showed that man to be task oriented his entire focus was on the job Sir Christopher moved along a little further and he saw another man and he asked him oh, what are you doing <clears throat> the man replied well I'm making a living in governor I'm, I'm making so much money on, on this job and that showed him to be survival-oriented. He came to a third man who's working there, and he asked him what he was doing. And interestingly, all three of them were doing the same kind of work. And the third man looked up, and he paused for a moment, and he said, Sir, I'm building a cathedral. He was goal-oriented. He wasn't just spinning his wheels, doing a job while he watched the clock. He wasn't even just making a living and merely doing his duty. He caught a glimpse of the architect's plans, the master plans for the building of what would become a great church building. He had an understanding of the importance and the significance of how, no matter how hard the work might be or the sacrifices even personally it might require, he was thrilled beyond words to personally ha have a part in the building of that great church. Listen carefully. The Apostle Paul was a man on mission. The Apostle Paul had also caught a glimpse of the great church, the God's master plan for the church. He had an understanding of its importance and significance. However hard the work might be, whatever sacrifice it might require, he was thrilled, thrilled beyond words, to have a part in the building of the Church of Jesus Christ. He would never give up. He would never slack off. No matter what happened to him or what suffering he'd be made to endure. So I wonder... Does that describe you? Does that describe me? Have you personally experienced God's rich grace in salvation? Have you caught a glimpse of the astonishing vision of the church that God is building? Jews and Gentiles together 
in fellowship in the body of Christ. Paul shared the secret of his life in three simple words. He declared it in Philippians 3 verse 12. Not that I've already grasped it all or already have become perfect, but here are the three words. I press on if I may also take hold of that for which I was even taken hold of by Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul is a great teacher. He knows the importance of repetition. So from verse 12, we go to verse 14 in Philippians 3. And he begins it with the same three words. He says, I press on. Press on what? Toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. We can run, run the Christian race well. And even if we began late, or if we started slowly, or if we even faltered along the way, and frankly, who hasn't? The secret is right here. Press on to be fully surrendered to the sovereign lordship of Jesus Christ in every area of our lives. And to stay true to Christ to the very last moment of the earthly life which he blesses us with. Will you do that?